Hello. Hey, it's Ryan. Hey. Sorry, right. do you need to go off to work soon, or what's your situation? Um, I have to go to work here in like 20 minutes, so I think we're good. I'll go late. I know you're pretty well known for your ethics, for your principles. What developed these principles for you? I don't really think of them as being principles that are developed. Rather, I think that other people's lack of principles has been developed. That's that has more, you know. Like in other words, I think that we are all, we all. I mean, I mean, do you? I mean, I don't. I can imagine that probably children, hey, children aren't bi babies aren't biased. They love everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And they're not. They're not. Babies don't have hate or. They're not prejudiced, uh, and they also don't, you know, they also don't, you know, smoke crack. That's that's adults who do that stuff. So I tend to think that the things that are that people all the kind of <clears throat> people talk about the things I've developed or the lifestyle I live. It's not a lifestyle; it's life. Um, the party is a lifestyle, frankly. Do you follow where I'm where I'm coming from yeah, on this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it's not. So I don't think this thing is being. People say, like, "Well, how did you like? When did you decide to do this?" Well, I didn't decide. I, I was. I am that. We're born sober. I mean, that's us. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, yes, I know. Technically, there's probably some babies that have some addiction because their mothers were using or something like that. But, but basically, I think human beings are born sober. That's the idea. So once you get past, once you get to that point, then you know you can. You accept that, then you realize that everything else is is that's the accoutrement, that's the addition. Um, and I just I just as things came into my life and were offered to me, and everything has been. My God, I was raised. You know, I'm 47. I was raised in the 70s, and and I you know my friends were I had you know drugs were all around me. Um, but as things came and were became to me, I thought I thought about them. I thought eh, just not what I want. I'm not going to do it. I know you're an advocate for all ages shows. What inspired that to always do all ages shows and always have it within a certain price range? Well, I think initially, I think obviously what, it, what inspired it was the fact that I was under 18. Uh, this is at a time where 18 was a drinking age. Um, but I was under 18, and I wanted to wanted to see bands. So obviously, I was pro all ages shows at that time, mm -hmm. right? I and mean, that didn't yeah. make sense. Um, as I got then, you know, when I was 18, um, you know, when I was 18, my brother wasn't 18, my friends weren't 18, uh, and I wanted them to see the band. I want, you know, if Meyer Threat played a show, I didn't want them to be locked outside because they couldn't get in. So of course I was, you know, I was pro all ages shows. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> at some point, as I got older, I thought, well, people who aren't, they, if you just you don't support it like later on. It's only because you, it's like okay, well, it's okay for you now because you're old enough. I still look. I'm I still don't go see band uh, shows that are on all ages. Like if they're a punk band, and the fr even friends of mine recently I had a really good friend who played in town, but he played a 21 and up club. I said I just can't go to your show. I'm not going to do it. I said I just don't believe in. I think that music is for all people. I actually I don't think that. I know it for all people and the sole reason that shows are not all ages um, the, I mean, really not, may not maybe not the sole reason but the basic reason has to do with um, the alcohol industry and I don't know why that industry gets to decide who gets to see music and who doesn't I mean, how old are you now? I turned 24 on Tuesday alright did you like music when you were 16? yeah of course did it mean anything to you? Of course. Did it, did you was it important even? Definitely. I mean, it's it's yeah. So a I mean, part. what so what the fuck? Like so, a band that was important to you, a band that you wanted to see, um, a band that came to like a band that you lived, spent real spent time with their, their records, and mm -hmm. then they came to your town, and you couldn't see them because you weren't twenty one. Doesn't that seem a little disgusting? Totally. Yeah. So it's just. I mean, I don't know why anybody thinks it's, it would be weird for me to be supportive of all age shows. I mm -hmm. I mean, I just think it's strange that people even participate in what is something that is so clearly discriminative. I mean, how can somebody, what can somebody who's 16 do about the fact he or she is 16? Not a goddamn thing. So then we need to look out for them. You mentioned the alcohol industry tying in with the music industry. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? In my mind, alcohol has 
that industry has really brought our culture uh, into line into thinking that that alcohol somehow is a deeply connected important mandatory aspect of music and, mm -hmm. and culture and could create you know um, I don't agree with that I think that is the result of an effective advertising campaign it's, um, but you know alcohol basically um, music which I think of as a art form it's a higher a sacred art form actually I think of music is a form of communication that predates language so the idea that music would be consigned to a role um, that is essentially a shill for the alcohol industry and what I mean by that is you know when when by and large if you want to see a band where would you see them at a rock club right and what is the basic economy of that rock club alcohol I guess right it's a bar <laughs> it's just a bar it's what it is yeah I mean basically the audience is the bar's a band's audience is the, is the bar's clientele mm -hmm. so if you think there wasn't if there was no bar there they weren't they're not going to have you know they're not the shows aren't going to happen because the economy of that bar has become suffused with the economy of, of, of the bands of the rock and roll um, so you so basically somehow they have managed to make the alcohol industry uh, a, a necessary aspect of of music but you know imagine if think about it like in other form other art forms I mean would you agree with me that, but let me by the way would you agree with me that the alcohol I mean essentially is an economy based on self-destruction for sure all right so imagine if you were a poet um, and you want to do a poetry reading um, but the only place in which you could do the poetry reading is in a crack house or okay. let's say you're a playwright and all the, the the theater that you've all the plays you've done the, the only way you can do it but it's, it's like basically on a on like a um, at, at a, a place where they have dog fights <laughs> it's like that's, cause that's where the money's coming in yeah. I mean that's what it's that's what it's kind of come down to um, and I mean I don't and I'm being obviously I'm exaggerating to make a point but really I think if anybody sits back and thinks about it it's obvious that the alcohol industry has really hijacked music mm -hmm. and um, I don't. I just don't accept that, and I'm not going to participate in it if I can avoid it. To some degree, I know that, for instance, like when Fugazi was playing, um, you know, obviously we are drawing thousands of people, and our we have a, you know, it's it's a responsibility to make sure you don't put people in the harm's way. So, <clears throat> in that light, we obviously were, you know, we're not going to, you know, just go to some like rent an empty warehouse and we don't even know if you know like we just bring the thousand two thousand people into a room and there's no you know, we don't know what the safety situation or obviously we have to be aware of that and because of the nature of the way the music um had worked out you know by and large the venues in which were the, made the most sense for us were going to be rock clubs and they're going to have they're going to have bars um the larger clubs and venues um, but, you know, we would go, if that was the case, and we would go in and demand that it would have to be all ages, that we would make the ticket prices reasonable, um, you know, that we would bring our our sort of agenda into their their situation. Um, but the, you know, but otherwise, you know, like with the events, for instance, the, the band that I'm playing with, Amy, um, we don't play clubs. You know, we just, we just find other, we have our own PA, our own lights, and we just try to take music um, anywhere it can go. So we played libraries, we played backyards, we played in, you know, museums and art galleries. We played in, you know, uh, pool houses and, you know, anywhere we can find. I remember when I was 16, I went into a, a to a record store and I tried to buy a CD with a parental advisory, and they wouldn't sell it to me. Uh, um, you went to the wrong record store. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on that as far as parental advisories and record stores not selling to kids? I think, I mean, how would you, would you, how do you define a kid? Because, <laughs> I mean, you're going to get into, I mean, there's a sort of a, a distinction here, which I think is, um, I mean, obviously there's, there are things, I think, like for instance, like maybe a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, maybe it's kind of thing that, you know, they're, they're still, the parent is playing a role 
in their lives that is you can't sort of trump the parents' decision. So, mm-hmm. if for instance parents have a really strong belief about um, I don't know maybe sexuality or religion or whatever, then I think it might get a little tricky. You don't want to be in a situation where um, you know a child wants to buy something that's going to be very confusing for them um, in terms of that. But you're talking about records. I'm talking about music, which is there's a distinction. Um, you know, I don't think I think that music is for all people. So if a kid, a little kid wants to come to a show, that's fine with me. But obviously, you know, I also think that you know you don't want to have like a two-year-old at a Fugazi show in the front row. That might be a little bit. <laughs> so I mean, I think that there's there within reason. But I think that more to the point is the idea that you have legislation, you have like laws in place that prohibit access. That's more of the issue. Um. In terms of parental, I mean that's that was voluntary on part of the record companies, and that was and the bands too. That's what they decided they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't do it, but you know, I also didn't. I didn't by choosing not to participate in that. I also don't have access to the the sort of larger distribution network. Mm-hmm. I have to ask you about the term straight edge. I know that you wrote the song Straight Edge back years ago. I'm a little unclear on how it goes from, uh, you know, initially writing the song and performing it. It somehow becomes a movement, and you didn't intend it to become a movement. I mean, I find it difficult to believe that you can't imagine how that would occur. I mean, it's just the, uh, I mean, the song, I coined the phrase straight edge, and I wrote a song about an individual's right to choose how he or she want to live his or her life. Um, it resonated with people. Some people picked up on it as sort of like a kind of a you know a, a positive idea they they related to and they wanted to, they identified with it and they felt like it was a way to connect with other people uh, and at some point I think other people heard it as a code of behavior um, and both of those things some I mean the word movement is a little bit it's a little blurry I mean how do you define movement there's a couple different things going on here one is in our world of music that <clears throat> we have sort of a rack mentality, meaning that we're the people spend a lot of time um, talking about genres because genres is a way to sort of parse the larger like pile of music that's out there. So we identify as you know, we identify as this, or we identify as you know, it's, it's, you know, see what I'm saying? So it's sort of like this like I'm, you know, this band is punk, or this band is grunge, or this band is whatever, um, and that has to do with our this rack mentality. Um, straight edge, I think, at some point, I think people started to think of that as a kind of music. So I guess there's that that kind of movement. Then there's other people who actually were more fundamentalist people who saw it as almost like a religious cause, and that's a different kind of movement. Um, I wasn't involved with either one of those. I never called Minor Threat the Straight Edge Band, and I never, um, I never thought of Straight Edge as a, a fundamentalist movement. I don't, I just don't agree with that. It's not the way I think about it. Um, for me, it was always a song about an individual's right uh, to live how they wanted to, and that's what I was interested in. So obviously, that would be an individual's concern is often at odds with a with a movement. Movements are. Um, yeah, they're they're saying like, come on, join us. But that wasn't the idea. I have to ask your viewpoints on corporate media and how it affects the public. In what field? Television, radio. Um, I think that if you're, I think if you are a um, an industry that is trying to <clears throat> sell something. To 300 million people or more, then I think you need to make it pretty palatable in a very, like, from sort of an alarming way. You have to make things very palatable. You have to, and you also have to appeal to people's basis instinct. I mean, like their lowest common denominator. Um, mass media is a business, obviously, and um, the major broadcasters. You know their bottom line is dollar, not a, not a. It's not an ethic. Uh, so I think that they, by and large, um, are 
uh, mind-numbing, but more pointedly, I think that they have done a terrible disservice by um, stoking fear, um, and especially, I think that um, the role of the major media in the early part of this century, first, you know, 2001, 2002, uh, was was really murderous. And I don't think that this country would be engaging in the kind of sort of criminal military actions that this country is, is engaging in had the media not played a role in fomenting it. They, you know, they were being the drums of war. Um, and they were also scaring the crap out of everybody. Now I can tell you that <clears throat> the day those planes crashed in 2001, I didn't watch the television. Because I knew that there would be nothing, the only thing that could occur if I was to watch that, and they'd show the same thing over and over and over, is that I would become desensitized to it. Um, and I would become numb. And it's when you, one becomes numb that the real violence can really start. Um, it's like going to the dentist, right? So once you your gums are numb, that's when they really start cutting. So I was not interested in being numb, and I wasn't interested in being scared. I just don't, I'm not scared. And I wasn't scared then. And I live, you know, a mile or less from the Pentagon. So I was certainly aware of what was going on. I could see the smoke. Um, but I was not going to watch television. I wasn't going to try to get my mind around it. I certainly wasn't going to engage in hatred. Uh, I'm sad that human beings are brutal to each other. I don't understand it. Um, and it's a really, it's, but I also don't understand you know, cancer or I don't understand uh, earthquakes that knock down buildings. You know, I, it's, it's beyond comprehension. And uh, what I can do is to not engage in it myself and also to not be supportive of other people who do. Mm -hmm. So I think that the media has done this terrible disservice by um, putting their, um, especially in that situation. I mean, it was very good business for them. Let me tell you, when your people are so scared they got to watch television 24 hours a day, that's good for them. That's when the advertising uh, revenue really cranks up. Yeah. So, so I think that their motives are beyond suspect. And um, also, don't forget that by and large, the only people who have access to get to their to those those stations are people who are in some position of like corporate power anyway. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like I've been in bands that have toured, you know, all over the world and I would say that, you know, I'm fairly well known in a lot of those you know, in, in other countries I'm pretty well known. Um as and respected as a musician. But um in this country it's really different, and I think it's by and large because it, I have no access to the. I really don't have any access to the major media. I just don't. It's not. I just don't exist in their world, and it's okay. I don't really. I mean, it's not like I'm. I'm not upset by it, but it is. It's a really good. I think example of the way that the their interest is only in working in with their comrades in the in the music industry. They're just not going to talk about. They're not going to talk about real music. They're going to talk about the music that's being sold. I have one more thing to ask, and then I got to get going to work. But uh, there are generations of your family members that have lived in D.C. What are your thoughts on the Obama administration? Well, my family. You're right. We we are. I mean, I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian, but I have to tell you that we're not political. Like we're not government people, and. You know, it's just this is the latest, <laughs> this is the latest boss. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, um, couldn't be happier to have um, Bush, the Bush administration, out of this, out of here. It was a bummer. There, I think they were very um, deeply disturbed, um, unwell, bad thinking, poor-minded, greedy um, jackasses. And uh, I'm really happy to see them out of office. I think the fact that they took this country into war um, is disgusting. So I'm glad to see them go. Now, does that mean that I think that Obama and his people are going to be, like, incredible? 
Not, I don't think that yet. You know, let's see. We'll give them their opportunity. I mean, anything moving away, anything to move away from where we've been, I'm all for. Um, well, I don't. I do think if you grew up in Washington, you kind of know that the choices are limited. But if, you know, if I have a choice between, you know, an arrogant guy with a gun in his hand versus somebody who seems a little less um, self-important, maybe, with a gun in, in the drawer. I'll take that. <laughs> They're both dangerous, but at least one has to to open the drawer. That's what's like living in Washington when it comes to that kind of stuff. But it really, I have to be honest with you. Again, my family are not government people. I'm of Washington, D.C., the city, not the federal city. So that that's just the big business in town. Where do you live? I live in L.A. All right. What part of L.A.? I live in North Hollywood. All right. So you know how you live in – did you grow up there? Uh, no, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Well, in Columbus, for instance, like what's the business in Columbus? The school? Is that the main business? It's a pretty big business there. It's all, it's capital, isn't it, Columbus? Yeah. Yeah. So so you know how like basically you have the school and you have like the government. Um, but that's just the business – that's just the big factory in town, right? Those are the two mm -hmm. big factories in town. Yeah. And that's what the federal government is here. It's just a big factory. And that's – people come to work here and then they go off. But the rest of us, we, just, we live here. We're of this town. Well, hey, I really appreciate you taking time and – and answering these questions. Sure. Give my regards to Fred if, or Freak if you see him. I, I will do that. And also, I know you have a birthday coming up. So happy birthday as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I'm turning up. Yeah. I'm turning 47 next week. Awesome. All Thank right, you. man. Thank you very All much. Right, Bye. Take care.